and reading from Luke, the seventh chapter. If you are able, I invite you to stand with me in honor and reverence of our Lord. We turn to Luke in the seventh chapter, beginning at verse 36 and reading down through the third verse of the eighth chapter. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the anointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then, turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, you see this woman, I entered your house, you gave no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time she came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has forgiven little, little, loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Our message this morning looks over in Galatians in the second chapter as we continue to look through this letter of Paul. And... Uh, a very important letter because it is written into an area where there were not Jewish Christians. These were all Gentiles. So it's like you and I. We're all Gentiles. And the message has come to them and they're explained to them that the true gospel is one that does not regard them as different than the Jews but retreats them in the same way, the same grace that God has given to the Jews, God has brought to the Gentiles as well. That is the true gospel. We looked at that last week. So this, e this morning, looking in the second chapter, <coughs> beginning at verse 15, we hear these words. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, Jesus isn't, or Paul isn't speaking inflammatory against them. It was just a common statement in regard to the Gentiles or sinners. He's just 
we might not like that language or the way that said, but it's just kind of coupled together. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. We also have believed in Jesus Christ. In order to be justified by faith in Jesus Christ, and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if we rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law... I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. The word of the Lord. Uh, this, these few verses are a very densely packed passage. One of the most important passages in the New Testament. It includes a multitude of theological concepts and practical applications. We hear the terms justified, justification, righteousness. All three of those words come from the same Greek root word. We hear the law and works of the law. The flesh, faith, faithfulness, to die, to live. In Christ, with Christ, but Christ, and crucified. All of them, each and every one of them, a very important concept. But it's impractical and unrealistic for me to try and to parse out all those things and discuss all of that in a sermon. Because this is not a two to three hour Bible class or an academic class. And even that wouldn't be enough to, to truly delve into each and every one of those terms. So I want to encapsulate though, all of those concepts in what I've listed up here is the title to the message, Cruciform Life. Think about a cruciform life. It applies to those who are not yet Christians and to those who have accepted that Jesus is the Son of God and that by his death, he has given forgiveness of sins to each and every one of us. Both must realize that the observance of the law, and this is true whether Jew or Greek, Synichthian, barbarian, male or female, anyone and everyone must come to the realization that observance of the law cannot make a person a Christian. The cross is critical. Salvation comes sola gratis comes only by the grace of God. The only way that we are saved is because of God's grace. Not anything that we have done. Not because who we were born to. Not because of any educational position. Not because of our ethnicity or anything else. It is because Jesus emptied himself and gave himself for us. He became sin for us that we might not suffer the penalty of sin. Jesus became a human being, set himself from all of his divinity, 
and subjected himself to be crucified. And that is the only way to salvation. And we must all come to realize that. Now Paul, if we look at his example of his life, Paul had lived a very zealous life as a Jew. He describes himself in Philippians as a Jew above Jews, as a Pharisee above Pharisees. He had all the ethnic, educational, and all the other advantages that would say he was a good and righteous child of God. But he discovered that all of that did not make him righteous before God. What he discovered was that the law, as holy as it is, as good and right and true and perfect as the law is, what it accomplishes is reveal to us how far we are from being who God created us to be. It points out our inadequacies. It points out our fallenness. Because there's not one person who measures up to the law. There is no perfect person. Each and every one of us have some failure. We might say, yeah, but I've never done that. It doesn't matter. You've done that. And that is as bad as that when it comes to sin. Doesn't matter what the sin is, there are no tears to sin. Sin is sin. And the wages of sin is death. And all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So none of us measure up in that sense. Martin Luther was, uh, as a monk, uh, regarded to be a kind of like Paul, but he was a, a Christian zealot. He tried to do everything that he could do to make sure he was a good monk. He lived all of his life in discipline and penance. He did self-denial. He kept himself out of certain things that he might enjoy. He would even torture himself. Back in the 16th century, they would take a whip and, and they would flagellate themselves to show, oh, I am a wretched person. Let me be beaten with 40 lashes like Christ was. And so he would kneel down and pray and whip himself across the back. Luther said, if I can find it, if any man could be saved by monkery, by being a monk, then I was that man. He, he even went to Rome, and there's a set of stairs that are made of stones that are brought from Israel and from the path that Jesus had walked, and they would create this long staircase, and people would go and kneel down on it and walk on it on their hands and knees and hands and climb up it and um, seek to show by their devotion of doing that how much they love God and that God would bless them. There, there's a replica of those stairs in Pittsburgh at a, a chapel of St. Patrick. And let me tell you, it is not easy to climb those things. And it, I didn't get any blessing out of climbing them on my knees. You know, it was painful. And he did that and he thought, oh, God is going to bless me because I have suffered in this way. And as he climbed up to that, he heard the voice of God say to him, the just shall live by faith. 
Not by these deeds, but by faith, by believing. When I was in Costa Rica on a work and witness trip, uh, I was visiting the uh, cathedral, the national cathedral there in San Jose. And uh, the path from the back of the sanctuary up to uh, before the, the altar and the, the railing are these stones uh, along the walk. And they're, they're not smooth rocks. They're just rugged rocks that have been placed there. And women will come with their babies and hold their babies, carry their babies, and walk on them on their knees up to the altar in thinking that in some way God will bless their baby because by the time they get up there, their knees are bloody. You've probably seen pictures of people in Brazil that go to the Christos Redentor. Up on the mountain, the, the picture of Christ who overlooks Rio de Janeiro and people will climb the mountain on their knees thinking that if I do that, that God will have favor upon me. And what they get is bloody hands and knees. Doesn't matter what it is that we do, that will not give us the grace of God. And so Paul is, he's looking at all of these acts, these works of law. Now that, that is not saying that, that Christianity then is a uh, sit back in the easy chair and say, oh, Jesus died for me, so I don't have to do anything. I can just sit back and believe and I, you know, I've got it on easy street. Uh, it's not a cheap grace, but it's not a meritorious grace. It's not that if we do these works of the law, if we come to church every Sunday, if we read our Bible for an hour every day, if we pray every day, if we do all these things, we give to the poor, and I've got a little tally sheet, and I'm keeping char track of all these things that I do, and, oh good, God's going to bless me. Well, that's what the Arabs do. You know, you, you come to the end of your life in the Islam and, and you hope that as Allah looks at the list that you've got more pluses than you do minuses. And if you've got more pluses than you do minuses, you get to go into paradise. I mean, there are Christian groups that do the same thing. Oh, we go out and we do things even if somebody slams the door in our face. Oh, we do it with a smile and we walk off because that's five extra bonus points if you get your door slammed in your face and you still smile about it. No. That is not what saves us. And so Paul says the only way that we are saved is by believing that Jesus Christ died for us. That it was because God loves us. It is by the grace of God that we are saved. But I thought you said, you know, it's not an easy street. Well, then how do I show <coughs> my love for God? How do I show the acceptance for what God has done? John Wesley, in looking at the way that Christians respond, that most people, when they come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and they believe that Jesus died on the cross for them, and they go, wow, okay, good, I have salvation now. But after they've been a Christian for a little while, they begin to think, you know, there's got to be something more to it than that. I mean, I'm not looking for bonus points. I'm not looking to add crown or jewels in my crown. But there's got to be something about this relationship with Jesus Christ that is more than just saying, Jesus died for me. 
And, and so as Wesley looked at that and saw that after becoming a Christian, one realizes that there is more. There becomes a hunger, a thirst to a closer relationship with Christ. There becomes a desire for a deeper understanding of what Christ has done for me. And, and the more that we understand about Christ, we think about, wow, those are nails. He did that for me. He suffered in that way for me. He loved me that much. I mean, if he loved me that much, how much do I love him? <clears throat> how is my life a response to that love that God has shown for me? We begin to contemplate what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Have this mind that was in Christ Jesus. Have the mind of Christ. So as you begin to think about having that mind, developing the mind of Christ, of a cruciform life. Jesus is the example of a cruciform life. As I said with the kids, we call it a cruciform life because it's connected to the crucifix. The crucifixion. And Jesus demonstrates for us a crucified life. And so we think about, what does that mean? And, and so Wesley said, well, as we are Christians, we, we come to this realization that I need a deeper infilling of grace in my life. I need to be transformed by the Holy Spirit in my life. I need sanctification. It's not that that's a better aspect of I got salvation and then I got sanctification. All I got more you got. No, it's not that. It's this I love all the more. I want to draw closer. I want to be more of who Christ has shown me. So we see that there's a connection between what Paul says in Philippians in the seventh chapter that Jesus made himself done. So Paul said, have this mind. What mind did Jesus have? Jesus made himself nothing and took the form of a servant. Have that mind. And here Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. So that's why I was saying to the kids to think about well, what would it be to be on the back side of his cross with him? How might I join him? How might I be crucified with Christ? How might I love God as much as God has loved me? How might I participate in the cruciform character of God? What did Jesus do? He emptied himself. So the cruciform life is first and foremost an emptying of ourselves. Saying, I set aside all that I have and all that I am to be who God wants to be in and through me. And then it is living a life with Christ as Christ is in me through the power of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate the nature, the character of Jesus Christ. To love as Jesus loved. That was Jesus' great commandment. As I have loved you, 
so love others. So when we empty ourselves of ourselves so that we can be filled with Christ, that we might love as he loved. And that becomes the deeper relationship, the closer relationship with Jesus. It's not about doing more things or doing special things. It's not about religious activity. Not that those things are bad, but those are not meritorious. It's about letting go of the control of my life. Letting go of all the legalistic demands that others might try to put on me or that I might try to put on myself. Letting go and letting Christ be all and all in us. It is a life of faith in the grace of God that God loved me so much that he gave his only son for me. It is a life of loving God and loving others as he has loved us. So this morning, think about, are we <coughs> trusting fully in what God has done for us through Jesus Christ? Are we willing to empty ourselves completely that he might fill us with himself that we might be Christ to the world as we go to prayer this morning think about what does it mean to be crucified with Christ and through Christ to live with him, to live through him in all that we do. And as we, as you stand with me, as we sing these words to the song, if you want to use the altar as a place of prayer to say, Lord, okay, here I am. I let God. It's not about doing more. It's about letting you be everything in me. I invite you to sing with me and to pray with me. <coughs> I humble myself before you, falling down at your feet. I humble myself before the King of Kings. And worshiping at your footstool, I offer my heart of praise. In humble sword, I magnify your name. You are the Holy One. You are the righteous Judge. Creator of all life and sustainer of my soul. I humble myself before you, falling down at your Myself before the King of Kings and worshiping at your footstool, I offer my heart of praise. In humbleness, Lord, I magnify your name. Well, if you just put back the first slide of this for us, I humble myself before you. Falling down at your feet, I humble myself before the King of Kings. Is that your prayer this morning? Does that express your life? Go bow your hearts with me. <clears throat> the Lord, help us. <coughs> Fill us with your grace. Enable us through your Holy Spirit to give our lives fully, completely, 
totally for your will to be accomplished in and through us. May you be king of kings over our lives. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your mercy. Now help us, Lord, as we go out from here this morning that we might go out in your grace and reveal your love to others that they too become to know your saving and sanctifying grace. Let us go in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.